as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, reporting live from the cam. High in demand, so please stand by if you can. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you're younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought. Hey, what's going on, guys? We are here with another episode during quarantine. I'm your host, Emma Marie, with Real Fans Real Talk, and I have my two favorite guys with me. Trip, what's going on? And Legend in Two Games, Eric, what's popping? What's going on? It's excited. Another another night of uh, Real Fans Real Talk, and we got a lot to get into. Yes. Yeah, so you know the sports world has been on halt because of this crazy COVID nineteen. So Eric, remind us again every week how many days. Has it been without sports? So technically, it is day 69 without sports. However, and the reason I say technically is we have seen the UFC slowly come back without any fans. Uh, NASCAR is now returning without any fans. And we saw a recent charity golf event um, that slowly rolling everything out. Also, we're hearing about practice facilities starting to slowly open back up. So it is day 69. However, some of the lesser viewed sports, and that's not a knock against them. They're starting to, sh to roll things back into the normal swing of things. Don't forget my man Gronk got that 24-7 belt at the, uh, at the WWE pay-per-view. You're right. That is true. Yeah. <laughs> I know that's not really official. <laughs> official. That might be a little fake sports, but still, we got to take what we can get at this point. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, that's more on the entertainment side. But as I mentioned, you know, it, it's slowly working its way back in. Um, and we're starting to hear some good news. Isn't that right, Trip? Oh, uh, a lot of good news. Actually, you know, on on a personal note, I, I'm actually really good about uh, talking about this uh, first subject because uh, my main man, Magic, out, out there in the West Coast, he, uh, he he's making up for, I guess uh, we spoke about this actually when Smith Parker was on on the uh, on the show with the uh, big billion dollar corporations like the Lakers soaking up all of that, um, that PPP loan money. And even though they gave it back at, you know, at this point, they, they gave back the $4.9 million, which could have probably helped so many small business, actual small businesses. Um, but, you know, Magic has stepped up and he is offering $100 million in loans to minority owned uh, small businesses, which I really love because now it's going to give guys like us, M, you know, Raw Beauty Co., the, the, the real small businesses that could use that, that money it's going to give them a chance to actually to, to, to get that money. So he is uh, teaming up um, with his Magic Johnson Enterprises company is partnered with uh, MBE Capital. And uh, they're going to be offering up $100 million in, uh, in loan money. So if you missed out on them PPP uh, loans, you better you better find out what's going on with Magic. Reach out to Magic. You better DM him, hit him on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever. However you got and find out what's going on. But $100 million is up, and it is going to go to minorities. So big shout-out to Magic for that. You know, Magic is probably, you know, if not the best, one of the best businessmen um, after his uh, career in his, in his uh, respective sport. And he's showing us once again, you know, how to, how to turn up even further. So I appreciate you for that, Magic. Absolutely. It's um, – it's, it's, it's been great to watch Magic's moves uh, as he stepped away from the game. And, you know, I've always admired his business savvy. We, we talk about the movie theaters. We talk about all the other endorsements and, and things that he's partnered Plus. with. Right. And so now to see him give back in that way, it's, it's, it means a lot to the community, first and foremost. And it's, it's a great thing that he's doing. Yes, I agree. And I was extremely excited to hear this because, as you guys know, I mean, I've been pushing Raw Beauty Cosmetics forever. So you guys know I own my own skincare line. So 
just to know that people are, you know, who may not be even directly affected by COVID um, because of their financial situation to, to give back, especially to target minority businesses um, is amazing. So, you know, he's a legend in himself. So speaking of other legends in the NBA, um, as you guys know, the Michael, uh, Michael Jackson, Lord. <laughs> Rest, rest in peace. <laughs> Another icon, right? Um, the name Michael is just iconic. So um, the Last Dance documentary, which was one of, which is the most watched documentary of 2020. Um, 2020 has been a crazy year. So this has uh, been the light of it. Um, but yeah, this millions of views, um, basically a documentary that we spoke about every week that really um, dug deep into uh, Michael Jordan's life. And we speak about it time and time again of how Jordan was not one to really sit on camera with media and really divulge all of his personal information. But this was almost like not only a tell all, but he, it got emotional. We had, we, we were, for someone like me who wasn't a part of that generation, we really took the walk of his whole journey. Um, so this series took part over a five um, Sunday uh, course of time. And um, yeah, it, it's over, but what do you guys think about it completely? Well, really, really, really quick, it, I, you know, I don't not. I still think it would have been uh, probably still the most watched uh, documentary on ESPN this year. But it definitely did have a little little bit of help in the fact that there's literally nothing else to watch. You know, what I'm saying on television right now. Now again, not to say because I still think it would have it would have did crazy numbers anyway. But the fact that we literally have no no major sports going on right now definitely gave them the, the, the extra boost on the numbers because we were like literally begging for anything to watch and when they, when they said it was going to be pushed up the uh the, the edit was going to be pushed up everybody was like oh thank you we, we finally got something but um as, as far as in regards to the to the, the documentary as a whole an amazing uh documentary every episode you know i feel like it, every week i just i like i wanted more of the documentary i was i wish they could we get a, a, another couple of episodes out of it you know um mm -hmm. just again nostalgic being able to go back to to a time where i grew up as a jordan fan and a scotty fan so yeah. to relive a lot of those moments especially you know them beating on the knicks in the playoffs that was you know i, I loved all of that <laughs> so it was good uh seeing them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to put a picture up over that now. <laughs> I've seen a writer write, um, we could have watched a hundred episode part documentary series about Michael Jordan and still feel like we did not know enough about him. So I think there's still so much. And um, I had seen some critics say, you know, the documentary just displayed that he was really simple, but really complex. Like Jordan's one that you can't even put your finger on to how to like categorize him as a person. There's so much more. I feel like we still don't know. Um, but it was amazing to just give people an inside look of these moments in history that we've seen, but didn't really know the backstory. Now it feels like everything's full circle. Like you knew what happened before a game and how guys characters are. And uh, so it was were rather. So yeah, it was definitely amazing. Yeah. I, Em, I think you made great points to open up the convo. Um, there was this generation that's obviously a little younger than Tripp and I who didn't get to see Mike play. They, yeah. you know, it's only known through highlights or stories that they've been told. And so for that generation to see the man in action, see the accolades displayed in front of you, mm -hmm. see how, how other players were in awe of him in the moment. You know, when they show that clip uh, a couple episodes ago and back in episode seven when Kobe's on there, and he's in the locker room with other All-Stars, and they're all looking at Mike like he's their big brother. Even though they're all the same age and they should all feel like we're, we're equals, they all felt like we got we to gotta follow Mike's lead. And, yeah. you know, Reggie Miller in the, in the latest episodes where he said it, you know, he was like, I tried to trash talk one time and I learned the hard way. And from that moment on, I called him Black Jesus because I, I got to see it firsthand that this guy was the greatest player to touch the court. And that's not a knock on anybody else. But these 10 episodes showed us, I thought the director did a great job of tying in the most recent history, which we knew it was going to end off with 98, mm -hmm. but tying it back to those early years and showing us where that drive was coming from. You know, yeah. losing to the Celtics, even though he's dropping 50 and 60 points a game, he's losing. Losing to the Pistons as badly as he wanted to get over that hump and saying, you know what, I'm going to go add 15 pounds of muscle because these guys are just so physical. I got to find a way to beat them. Yeah. Um, 
And then when he got on top and handling the pressure of being on top, whether it was teams coming at him, whether it was media coming at him, um, unfortunately, the loss of his father. And this man just continued to be so driven to win. I thought the whole documentary was amazing. There are going to be some people who might have uh, small gripes with it and they might feel a certain type of way about it. But ultimately, I think the 10 episodes were, were well put together. The music fit the time, um, the behind the scenes, you know, talking about his relationship with his, with his security guard. And, you know, after so losing his dad. That, that yeah, guy? but Bob from McCounty was, was killing him in quarters. When they were yeah. playing quarters, Bob from McCounty was killing him. Um, but Gus, you know, who's the other bodyguard who unfortunately passed away several years ago and how that relationship with him and Mike, where he stepped up for Mike as, you know, a father figure after Mike's father died. But then in return, Mike being there for him as he dealt with cancer. Wow. Um, so I thought we learned a lot about Mike, the man that we didn't get to see during his playing time. Yeah. And he made a good point just speaking about um, it being full circle for, for those who my generation or younger that we just seen an image of Mike dunking and kind of the jump man image. But we didn't really know the Michael that certain people got to watch. And I think what was telling for me was this viral clip that I've been seeing all week of LeBron talk about the first time he's seen Mike, Michael Jordan. And that, because, you know, in our, my era, Jordan, I'm um, sorry, LeBron and Kobe and certain people who were like iconic to my generation to hear someone as legendary, even to this point, LeBron say, oh my gosh, when I seen him walk in the room, I didn't think he was real. I didn't think he was real. Like to, to for him to speak in that such iconic way, it really put into perspective, like how major Michael Jordan was to the game because someone like Mike, like LeBron was literally didn't even think he was real because he was so in awe. Yes. Yeah. And Who do you guys think, I'm sorry, Eric, I, I, I want to get your opinion. Who do you guys think is most to blame for the last dance, for that season being the last dance? Oh, uh, without a doubt, Jerry Krause. I think it's it's without a doubt Jerry Krause. I think anytime um I've I've heard different um basketball icons say this and uh, Bill Walton has said it um Larry Bird has talked about it as well because they were part of historic Boston Celtic teams that highlighted the 80s era and they I I heard both of those guys say that the toughest thing to do in sports is keep winning because as you win egos get bigger and sometimes people want certain accolades or acknowledgements that not to say they're not deserving of, but those things get in the way of you being able to continue to win. Like everybody wants to win, but when you win once, are you hungry enough to not win a second time? Right. And if you win a second time, are you still going to be hungry enough? Or are you going to say, Hey, I, I did it already. So I'm good. You know, that's what separates the legends from just the good players. You know, when we, when we talk about the, the, the greatest, we always talk about how many rings they won. Yeah. Um, but I think Jerry, the reason I blame Jerry Krause the most is because, it is mind boggling to me to think that your team has just won, going into 98, had won five championships in seven years. You've got the best dynasty going in basketball and you would be willing to break it up because you feel you're not getting acknowledged enough for your part in building that. Yeah. To, to know- That was the best documentary since, um, right. dynasty since the Celtics. Right. You know, I, people forget that when, when the Bulls won that first repeat, there hadn't been a team that won a three-peat in almost 30 years. We're talking late 60s Celtics. That, that were the last team to win a three-peat. And now, mind you, that's spanning decades of, you know, the league having Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, you know. So you were coming with one three-peat, working on a second three-peat, and you would openly say, I don't care if we go 82-0, and 0, Phil Jackson ain't coming back. Like, his ego was just too big for the moment. And to say it out mind, loud is just crazy. Right, to say it out loud to the public and then to openly talk about what well, we try to skate, we try to trade Scotty and we have some options out there. Like, are you crazy? Like, yeah. imagine, imagine in this time, right? We just saw when LeBron and, and D-Wade teamed up in Miami and they went to four straight finals. Imagine going into that fourth year after being the three straight finals and you're working on your fourth. If Pat Riley would have come out and said, I don't care if this team go 82-0, and we're not keeping it together. Like, are you crazy? You're, you're telling me you're willing to walk away from LeBron James and his prime? And right. that's what Jerry Krause did. And I thought it was very telling that Mike even said himself, I wasn't ready to leave in 98, but I had no choice. They were forcing me out. The league also went on strike. So they started a little later in 99. Phil Jackson didn't come back. And that's why when people not Mike playing for the Wizards, 
Mike was 40 years old at that point because he had taken three years off because yeah. he felt forced out by the Bulls. But he has he's come out all the last couple of days since the last episode and said, I wanted to come back and I wanted to see if we could get that seventh title. I really wanted that challenge, but they wouldn't give me the opportunity to do it, which is absolutely insane to even think about. Yeah. I want to I want to put um, I want to split that blame between between both Jerry's Kraus and uh, Ryan's dog just because as the owner you have the ability to step in and say wait all right, wait a minute like you said we just won five out of the last seven chips and you want to get rid of the coach who just won us five out of the last seven it's not like I could like I could even understand a little bit more with bringing back certain guys just because physically, you know, getting older, yeah, I could see, you know what I'm saying, all right, maybe guys start to decline a little bit, even though most of those guys, the big names, Robin, Pippen, Kerr, played for years and, and, um, after that point. But the coach is like, age don't affect Phil Jackson from coaching. Like, why would you get rid of your your, 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 your coach that just literally took you to another back to back-to-back a championship game and, and to really let your GM go out there and make the statements that he was making in regards to Phil, you know, going 82 and 0 and he's still not coming back and, and, and the Scotty stuff, you know, he could have actually stepped in. Um, and then, you know, they said he did, he did try to go back at the end to, to Phil Jackson and see if he could get him to stay. And, you know, Phil was just like, you know, nah, you know, so, I, yeah, I got I to gotta put some of the blame on the owner, too. No, I, I thought about that as well. I'm sorry to cut you off, Ben. I, I did. I just wanted to just uh, send it to that point that Tripp made. Um, I thought about Reinsdorf as well, uh, but I did read an article where Reinsdorf had gone to Mike first. So mm-hmm. they win the championship in June of 98, and he had a one-on-one sit-down with Mike in July. And he said, look, before you make any decision, let me speak to Phil and see if I can at least get Phil to come back. Um, because the biggest beef amongst all of them was Phil and Jerry Krause. Um, because in 97 and 98, even though they were defending champs for whatever reason, Jerry Krause wanted to get rid of Phil Jackson. And, Jer- uh, and Jerry Reinsdorf had to step in a couple of times and get Phil back for on the one-year deals. And so he Why told, not step in at the beginning of the season, though, as well, opposed to get to the end? Right. And so what he tried to do from what I read was he, he sat down with Mike one-on-one after the 98 championship and said, look, before you make any decision, let me speak to Phil. And if I can get Phil to come back, are you willing to come back? And obviously Mike says, absolutely. That's my coach. And so when Phil wasn't willing to come back, it put Mike in that tough position of, if I'm going to come back, things are going to be different. It's going to be a different coach. And if, like you said, it may not be the same cast of guys. You know, maybe we keep Scotty, but do we keep Dennis Rodman? You know, do we keep Steve Kerr? So I think at that point, that's where it put Mike in that bind of, I want to come back, but I don't want to come back under these circumstances. And that's why even like I always highlight that if you look when Mike actually retired, Mike retired in December. Now, normally the NBA season starts in October, early November, but because there was a strike that season, the year didn't actually start to January. So Mike actually tried to hold out, hoping that they can get it back together. And once Mike saw that they weren't going to bring Phil back and they, they had already traded Scotty Pippen by December, that's when Mike makes the decision to walk away. I still blame Jerry Krause because as a GM, you got to step back and you got to understand what the bigger picture is. You hire a coach to win basketball games and he's doing that. You put a team on the court to win basketball games and they are doing that. So your acknowledgements will come later on. Let it ride out and keep winning as much as you can. Yeah, he had the biggest ego out of everybody. Right. No, so I, I definitely agree. Um, I was going to say, I think, you know, we always say it starts at the top. And so I didn't know that kind of happened where he touched base with Michael um, before, but I agree, like having a streak like that where the momentum is going, you have a great coach to kind of put that as a halt is um, seems like you're doing a disservice to the whole franchise. So, um, but you know, all we can do is kind of wish that we were able to, to, you know, see that happen and what that would have looked like. Cause that would have just added another, another notch to his um, amazing success. So yeah, I think, you know what, it, it it's crazy because it's kind of like the gift and the curse. Yeah. Just because you know what I'm saying it's like all right, we don't get the we don't get what we want. You know we do. Mike, you know he says that's one of his biggest regrets that they didn't get to go back and try for a seventh. But at the end of the day, 
let's just say they bring everybody back. And you know what? Maybe they're too old. And then they get and they do get back to, to the finals and they don't win. Yeah. Now legacies are changed now. Mm-hmm. If you if you if you wind up taking that loss. So it might have been, you know, for the best. That's just what it's supposed to be. That chapter was supposed to be those guys go six and oh and that's it. You know what I'm saying? And then and from there, I mean everybody's career was made from their time with the Bulls anyway. Phil became a legend. Mike yeah. became a legend. Scotty became a legend. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? I mean, Robin was, was already a top guy in the league, but you add three more rings to the two that he already had, you mm-hmm. know? So everybody everybody got that got that legend status from that era of Chicago basketball. So who knows if they, if they win again that seventh season. And then again, you know, now it's like, oh, well, was, oh, they got Jordan was only six and one. He wasn't six six and zero in the play. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So that kind of opens up a whole other thing if you don't win. Yeah, I mean, I think it it, it does, and it creates a, a great conversation. You know, because if yeah. if they if they come back with the same crew in '99, um, you know, would they have enough to beat Duncan and the Spurs that year? You know, because Duncan and Robinson were a very good team, and that was the beginning of their dynasty in '99. Right. So it it creates a great debate. Um, the irony in all this to me is that the the run of the Bulls almost ends the same way the documentary does from the standpoint of we wanted more. We yeah. wanted more episodes of the documentary. We wanted more years of the Bulls. And unfortunately, they both leave us at a point where we're, we're excited and we're satisfied, but we still linger for a little bit more. We wish we could have got another year or two of Jordan Pippen and the Bulls. Yeah. We had to, we had to live, live through the sneakers. That's it. <laughs> and the sneakers are living forever because they are just selling out always. It's crazy. Exactly. But even, even, even in a quarantine. <laughs> right, right. It even is the phenomenon of even that, though, because I, was, I wasn't I was a crazy Jordan sneakerhead growing up, you know, but I always was puzzled by the obsession or just being younger and seeing the lot. Like, it's just I, I always thought about that, especially in our community, but the the legendary status, the iconic just figure that Michael Jordan is it, it really makes sense you know why they do sell like that and he's such a it's just a statement in basketball and in sports and in fashion at this point so it's insane because he, he, opened, he opened the gates like you know you were saying Eric he, he literally opened up the gate with the sneaker game so you know to go from being the best player in basketball um you know, I don't know if people weren't necessarily calling him Mike the GOAT yet at, at that point, but he was definitely the best player in basketball and to the person that pretty much opened it up globally. I think it was uh, Rod, David Stern was saying how they were in like, I think, 86 countries. And then it jumped up to like 215 countries after Mike. And that was because Mike was in the air flying and doing all types of stuff that the, that the league, they saw it a little bit with Dr. J. But when Mike came in, he kind of just turned everything up. He literally carried them into the 90s. And then with the sneaker game being so crazy, Mike's legacy was able to really just be propelled because the shoot, the, the Jordan sneaker game might have been bigger than the Bulls legacy at, at yeah. that point. Just because of, we talking I, about 98 was what, 30 years? You know what I'm saying? And how many pair of Jordans you got in your closet, Eric? A, a bunch, a and bunch. I, I, I know you got a pair. <laughs> I'm. I have a few. <laughs> I, I listen. I growing up in that era, and again, M for for your era, that's a little behind us. Um, yeah. there were so many things about Michael Jordan that was just cool, and it wasn't even the winning. Like when you look back at him winning that slam dunk contest, and he got two gold chains on, like mm-hmm. that's just like the epitome of cool, especially when you come from yeah. our our culture. You know what I'm saying? To see a guy who looked like us, who walked like us on the court, and then it's like, I'm in a slam dunk contest and I'm going to keep my chains on. That was different. You know, and then he was getting the sneakers that matched the uniform. So it's like, it all made sense. It's like, you see that red and black Bulls uniform, and then you see a pair of red and black sneakers on, which at the time was unheard of. He, the Jordan mm-hmm. ones were actually banned by the league because the league required you to wear purely one color, color either all white or all black. And he was in Nike and Jordan was like, nah, we're going to do a signature sneaker that matches the uniform. That's going to look cool and sleek on the court. And they just kept enhancing it every year. Um, and as Anthony said, the sneaker brand, I think, was bigger than the Bulls because when he retired for that year and a half, he was still dropping 
editions of the Jordan series that were selling. So even though he wasn't even playing basketball, that clip that they show of Scottie Pippen pointing at the bottom of the Jordan 10s, like pointing at the Jordan symbol and saying, come back, Jordan ain't even in the game and he's still dropping basketball sneakers True. that are selling out. Yeah. So yeah. It, it, it was, as Tripp said, it was bigger than the Chicago Bulls. There are kids who will wear the Jordan sneaker before they would even wear a piece of Chicago Bull attire, yeah. but they wear the sneaker. So the sneaker outlived and outlasted the Bulls brand and it outlasted everything else from that era, aside from Jordan's name. The, the sneaker is just as big. Yeah, and plus we, we even see today how infused sports culture, fashion, hip hop, our culture is all mixed in, you know, just like when, I, when Alan Iverson came around and the braids, which was again, similar to the shoe not being one solid color, Mm -hmm. um, was an issue, right? And then it turned That's into, huge. you know, it's evolved and we just seen the consistency of the impact that not only these players, but the things they're wearing has had on our culture. And, you know, it's, it was, it was, they were pioneers at the time. And this guy's now getting these huge sneaker deals. Um, I found it crazy when I seen that he actually didn't even want to go with Nike. He wanted to go with Adidas. And yeah. it, isn't that, I, when I read that, that blew my mind. But I was like, the it, it is Nike that, that they can oh, yeah. Nike. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's crazy. But also remember, again, this is what I mean about he was he was one of us and he was from our culture. He openly said, I want to go with Adidas because I saw Run DMC wearing the track suits and, and the Adidas with no laces. And that was fly to me. So I wanted that. I wanted something similar to that. Um, but Adidas mm -hmm. didn't have the money for him. And uh, Sonny Vaccaro and some other influential people behind the scenes were like, nah, Nike's the move. And Nike was willing to not only invest in Mike, but also give him his own sneaker line where they were going to promote him, highlight him as the guy, as opposed to just some guy we signed. Yeah. yeah. And it, 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 all, it all worked out because Nike, one thing about Nike is they had the best shoe designers Yeah. at, at Nike. And that's, that's really what it was because there's so many, everybody got, they got sneakers that come out, but we all know there's only a handful of guys that we actually wear their sneakers. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't, like, honestly, I don't know nobody that wears Steph Curry sneakers. But he's he's one of the top players in the league. You know what I'm saying? I don't know too many people, you know what I'm saying, that that, that wear James Harden sneakers. I don't know I don't know a lot of people that, that, that wear Giannis sneakers. Like, when you think about guys that people – gravitate to their shoes i mean mike is just on a whole nother stratosphere and then you you got lebron you got durant and i think Kyrie will probably be like the around the top three like as far as current guys go but a lot of guys have shoe deals but people just don't buy them like that yeah i agree i it's it's tougher now um i think you know you, you like guys for certain reasons but it is tougher to buy into the brand um, than it was with Mike, because again, Mike made it all look cool at a time when there was nothing else like that. Um, but I always stick to the point that when there's someone who comes from your background, your culture, and they make it look cool on that level, yeah. you, you almost want to support them wholeheartedly because it's like, he's one of us and he's able to show the world what we like and what we're like. And I thought Mike did a great job of that. Yeah. Be like Mike. Yes, definitely. So moving on to the NFL, you know, we could talk about basketball all day. <laughs> um, the NFL announces changes to the Rooney Rule, seeking advanced diversity. Now, you guys know we've talked about this over and over again on the show, how the NFL is filled with black and brown players and the owners and the coaches. Um, there's just a disproportionate amount of those faces being represented and the officers higher up the offices higher up that matter. So um, I love that this discussion is is being talked about. Um, so the NFL is, is basically seeking to address the lack of diversity among head coaches and general managers. Um, they have taken several measures to try to improve these things. Uh, and the league just announced the expansion of the Rooney Rule and other changes. So how do, I know you guys are excited about this because I was very happy to hear that this is this conversation is really not being started, but really being um, works are happening. It's in the works. You want, you want to start, Eric, or you want me to go? Um, you'll start because I, I, I want what I'm going to say is going to lead back to Emerald because I have a question for Emerald on this as well. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm okay. So I'm always happy 
I guess when moves are being made to incorporate more uh, minorities into coaching and into GM positions. Um, however, the problem that I, that I have is that, you know, even with the, with the, that they were talking about, you can go 10 slots up if, with your third round pick, you can get a couple of compensatory picks. But my, my thing is, one of the, the big things that we forget that we need to change is it's a mentality that needs to be changed. So by me signing somebody just because I'm going to get an extra or a higher pick or get a couple of extra picks that I don't really, I still, I'm still not looking at you as an equal to, uh, to your, your, your white counterparts. I'm literally just doing this so I can get a higher draft pick and, and, and get an edge, get a couple extra picks. So I always, you know, have a little bit of, of an issue with these changes because it's not like anything is guaranteed. So it's like, all right, we have to have a certain number of candidates that get interviewed. However, if we don't sign them, then it doesn't matter how many minority candidates you interview, if you're still gonna pick, you know, uh, the, the white guy to, to, take the, to take the job, it really doesn't matter. So if there's nothing that's like mandatory for teams, you know what I'm saying? I think we, we, we're, not, we're still not changing that, that mentality of they can't do this, do this job. So there's got to be some, some, something better, a better way to, to deal with this situation because even with those picks, yeah, that's great. And I do think that as, once you get into those positions, you can kind of make a difference because you would look crazy to hire a, a, a black GM or a black head coach and the team wins, you know, does better than they were doing prior and just like, all right, well, now we're going to let him go. I got my draft picks. Now I'm gonna let him go if the guy does really well. So at least it's a situation where you get to showcase some talent. But there's still gonna be a lot of teams. I don't give a damn about going up ten extra spots just so I can hire this brother to, to come in. Nah. So yeah. you're still gonna have that mentality. And and before Eric, before you even go, I just wanna jump in and just for those watching, I just want to explain the Rooney Rule because I know when I first heard about it, I was unsure. Um, so this was adopted in 2003, and basically the Rooney Rule um, is an NFL league policy that requires teams, teams to interview ethnic minority candidates um, for head coaching jobs. Um, and so to Tripp's point, it's like, if this is, it's 2020 now, right? We still see a lack of our faces. So the fact that in 20, 2003, that this was implemented, you can interview as much as you want. You're right when you say it's a mentality change because we can do affirmative action and go through these motions and say, oh, we, we interviewed our black brown person today and let's just go back to the comfort zone of not even offering a position. Um, and plus the mentality of picking someone to fill that lack of diversity. You still want people who are qualified and you want to pick someone because you want them to value and be there for a purpose, not just to be there for a color um, that checks off your mark. Cause that doesn't feel good. And that's something that is not a good mindset to have as well. So, but go ahead, take it away, Eric. Right, right. So you guys both make great points and I completely agree with Tripp. I think this is deeper than just being able to interview minority candidates. Um, it's about a mindset. It's also about putting the right structure around these potential candidates. Um, I'm interested to see how this plays out because are, are you expecting teams to just interview and then you're going to grant them that pick that same year that they interview? Or is this one of those things like, no, you've got to show us it. Right. Or do you have to sign them? Is yeah. this going to be a thing where we're going to take your history into account and like, all right, so you've kept this coach on staff for three years. So now we're going to reward you with the pick. I want to see what the details of it are. Um, in the past, we've always compared the NBA's vision and their diversity to the lack of diversity in the NFL. Um, in the NBA, I think they have a structure that's better suited to fit everyone because yeah. they have, because they have their G league, because they have all these different scouting systems where you could say, Hey, look, I'm going to bring this candidate in. And even though he might be, he might not be ready to be a GM of my professional team. He could be a GM of my G league team, right? The Knicks did the same thing with Allen Houston. Allen Houston has been the GM of the Knicks G league team. And it's been rumored for a couple of years now that now he might be ready to step up because he's taken on that role. Elton yeah. Brand kind of did the same thing with the Philadelphia 76ers, where he worked right. with their G League team. 
So the NFL is going to have to put some sort of structure in place where they can say, look, we not only do we want to interview these candidates, we want to give them legitimate opportunities to take the job and do the best at the job. So whether it's some sort of intern program where you intern for a few, few years before you actually become a coach or a, a GM, whether it's some sort of um, summer program with, with potential draft picks, they've got to put the structure in place so that we're not just getting these token interviews. Because as you mentioned, Em, for years, that's what we've been seeing anyway. It's been token interviews. And unless you're a guy who was part of a big time coaching staff, you know, you're not going to get the opportunity again. One of the most famous coaching staffs in the NFL, black coaching staffs, was Tony Dungy's with Tampa Bay. It produced Lovey Smith. It mm -hmm. produced Leslie Frazier. It produced Mike Tomlin. All three of those guys went on to eventually hold the head coaching job. But it took Tony Dungy to bring them under the wing as a head coach and say, I'm going to develop these guys so they get their next opportunity. And that's what we need to see. We need to see more coaches say, give these guys an opportunity. Let them be my offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, wide receivers coach. Let them do something with the organization that's meaningful, not just yeah. the token black guy who's walking the sidelines and exactly. it, looks like, it looks like we're doing something, but that guy never gets a shot. Give him an opportunity, let him prove himself, and then in you know, two to three years, now he might be ready to actually take on a bigger responsibility as a head coach or an offensive coordinator or a general manager. Um, but ultimately, I'm interested to see, again, what is put in place to make sure that this is not just token interviews or token hires. And Em, I want to throw it back to you um, because I've always respected how opinionated you've been about Roger Goodell. Um, we've seen, since Jay-Z has come on board with the NFL, we've seen more and more of this, where the yeah. NFL seems to be reaching out a little bit more and trying to make the effort. Do you think the NFL is doing this because of Jay-Z? Or do you feel that internally they feel like, look, it is an issue. We need to figure out how to address it. Um, that's a great question. And yes, you know how I feel about Roger Goodell. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I was skeptical at first of Jay-Z's uh, association with the league, but I've seen nothing but aggressive and positive changes since he has been around. Um, and I do think that, <laughs> I do think that his influence of being around has made them um, question of a lot, a lot, and I think he is he is vocal. You know the few clips I've seen about him questioning um, the league and just uh, making the changes with the Rock Nation and what they were doing with the performers and giving back to community and picking a, um, a subsector of of uh, charity to give back and uh, reform and all those things that are going on. But I do think that he's definitely played a part in this. I don't think that this is a, an old boys club that is stuck in their ways for a long time. So I don't think they just woke up and said, we need diversity. I think that um, there's been uncomfort. There's been, I kind of feel like it's the elephant in the room that people act like they don't see. You know, when you go to these boardrooms, all white men, like someone has to be uncomfortable with this. And you got to think, take, take Jay-Z, who's now really um, having these meetings with these higher up men in the NFL organization. He's probably the only brother in the room. So that's probably prompting the question, oh yeah, while I'm at it, this doesn't look too good. So let's make some changes. So I definitely think that he has something to do with it because it's, it's insane. When you are the token, you feel it. And that's why I don't want this to turn into the tokenism thing as well. Cause that, that creates such a dynamic that's not good either. And just all in all, I just have to say too, like being in 2020 and the fact that we're still like, this conversation is just sick because it's like, it's 2020, tired. the whole field is black. And I'm actually happy that we're having a meeting or that they're making changes to finally hire some black folks as coaches. Like, it's like, what? Like, you know, and so it's almost ridiculous that this is, has to be a printed rule that, you know what I mean? So it, it's in one hand, I'm excited, but the other hand, I'm exhausted because it's just like, this, yeah. this, this diversity conversation is just like, has to be had, but it's, it's ridiculous. Yep. Look at you, your Super Bowl champions, right? The Kansas City Chiefs. And we sat up here a couple of months ago when we were, you know, before quarantine hit, and then we talked about the offensive coordinator from the Chiefs, Eric uh, Bieniemy. yep. Mm -hmm. We talking about the last two years, I'm just, I'm going to go, you know, the most potent offense in football. Yeah. You got an MVP out of that. You got a Super Bowl champion out of that, and you got a Super Bowl MVP and Patrick Mahomes. And this guy doesn't get a call. 
for none of the coaching vacancies uh, this year. And he and he his offense just won a Super Bowl, and the year before that, his offense produced an MVP. Right. And he doesn't get a call. Yeah. So you know it, it, it's it's rough, and because then it's like, all right, well, I'm glad he got a job. You know what I'm saying? But then again, shoot, if he gets a call to go someplace else, are they gonna hire him? Like you know what I'm saying? Because obviously he can't even get a call, and and again. His team just won the Super Bowl. His offense just won the Super Bowl, but he can't even get a call. And here you got these coaches, these white coaches, who can have losing season after season after season after season and will get job after job after job after job. So I almost don't even care for the Rooney rule yeah. just because, again, there's no guarantee that we're going to get a black coach, a black GM. Mm -hmm. a black offensive defensive quarter. We, there's no guarantees. But the only guarantee is that we have to show that we brought somebody in. Well, okay, yeah. I'm going to bring guys in, um, but and I'm going to interview them. You're going to see, look, I got the brother here, got the brother here, got the, this brother here, but we're still going with this guy over here. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter. I don't care how, how much he's qualified. Yeah. And that's why I say I want to I want to see what rules they put in place before you actually get compensated for the interviews and potential hire. Right. Because if you're just going to incentivize it to the point of, oh, you interview three black candidates, here goes a draft pick. No, then it's 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 BS. But if you're going to incentivize it by saying, look, not only do you have to interview a certain amount of candidates, you've got to actually give them a legit shot. So he's got to be on your coaching staff or your front office for three years. You've got to give him a legitimate chance to prove it so that if even if it doesn't work out with you, you know, if, if you get a guy who if, if you say, look, he's got to be in your front office for three seasons, even if it doesn't work out with you. Now he's got the credentials to be hired somewhere else. And now it's not just the token black guy who, oh, yeah, we interviewed and we hired him for one year. Guess what? It didn't work. Yeah. And, you know, and to your point, today is Malcolm X's birthday. And this, you know, at the beginning of this year, when, when um, Who Killed Malcolm X came out on Netflix, I forced my daughter to watch it yeah. um, because I felt it was a great documentary. Trip knows I, I texted it in the group chat because I liked it so much. And to think that here we are, almost 50 plus years later and we're still having these type of conversations about equality and what can be done to level the playing field. It's disgusting. Yeah. It really is. And I, I give a, I, I give credit to Jay-Z. I know some people were um, very harsh on him getting the job, mm -hmm. but I always felt like, look, you got to have at least a voice in the room if you want to see change. Yeah. And it feels like we're at least getting that voice because we see the NFL now involved with prison reform. We see the NFL at least, being a part of this discussion now, at least where they're acknowledging, hey, look, all right, let's, how can we make this Rooney rule better? Not, let's not treat it as just something that we're throwing out there. How can we make it better? And there were people who were critical of the Kaepernick uh, workout, but guess what? Jay-Z fought to at least get him a workout. Right. So we got to give kudos to those on the inside who are at least trying to fight and make things, uh, you know, equal for everyone. Yeah. And, and I know we have to move on because we could talk about this all day, but I just want to say too, you know, I know that race is such, um, is never an easy topic in America to, to discuss, but this brings me back to, you know, in, in the light, in light of Kaepernick and with all that was going on when he was kneeling, people kept saying, can we just keep race, race and politics out of sports? Why can we just keep the race out of it? And you can't because similar to the stigma that black men are unable to be quarterbacks and do that such that intelligent role well, is the same stigma that's being um, consistent in the um, higher leadership roles like team ownership and co head coaches. It's the same stigma. So what these players are going through on the field of not being granted the quarterback position is the same thing that the coaches are dealing with too because they're not being looked at as smart enough to handle all entire team. And this trickles back into generational wealth you know, having a, a role in the NFL as an owner or coach is obviously a head role financially too, you know, so this trickles down into this cycle and that's why race matters in these sports. And that's why we have to bring it up and we can't sweep it under the rug. Yeah, these guys own the teams for so long. So it's not, you know what I mean? Like, it's not like it's something where you got to give up every couple of years, you got to get fresh owners. No, we're talking about guys that own these teams for 20 and 30 plus years. So if you got that same mentality that you had when you first brought the team, and, and, and most of them do, or we would see more minority coaching hires, there, there wouldn't even be a need for a Rooney rule. Because there's no way you can tell me that in a league where 85 
percent damn near of the players are black and what five to ten percent of the the coaches and gms are minorities so there's no type of balance in that so and you can't you, sorry but, <laughs> i'm sorry y'all know i so and you can't help but to think about and i hate to i hate to compare this to slavery but you can't help but to look at the field and see white owners in a whole black field and think about just the notion of back in the day of keeping you know these men treating them like cattle and keeping them physically strong and mentally weak and just the it it just it's very uncomfortable to watch sometimes for me and when i think about it it gets me so upset because it's too consistent of our history and it's you're not right. that far removed you're right when you say that because now going going back to Kaepernick, right and this is why i don't really feel bad for dak that he hasn't gotten his new contract yet because when the protests were going on, Jerry said, basically, none of his players is going to be kneeling because if my bottom line get messed up, your bottom line is going to get messed up. And Dak stood with him in that moment. You took, Jer you took Jerry Jones' side in that moment. You went against your brothers on the field, the guys that got to go to war, your, your race as a black man, so you, gonna, you took Jerry Jones' side. And now that man got you waiting. He ain't even trying to pay you what you feel like you worth now. So how'd that make you feel, Dak, now that you, you did that? And he ain't, come, he, ain't, a, he ain't got your back. That's a great point. Um, yeah. And I will say this just to end off the, the topic. Um, if the NFL didn't feel there was a problem or didn't feel there was a lack of diversity, they would have never implemented the Rooney, Rooney rule in the first place. So the yeah. fact that you have the rule means you know there's a problem. Exactly. And, and like I said, I just hope that with this new, um, with the new adjustments and provisions they're making to the rule, that is done the right way. All I ask is give guys a fair shot. Not only should they be allowed to interview, but give them the fair shot on the job. Don't give them a one-year deal and say, all right, now prove it right away. Because as Tripp said, there are plenty of white coaches out here who ain't had a winning season in five years. And right. they're still getting to keep their job. You know, right. there are plenty of white coaches who ain't never won a Super Bowl and keep getting more jobs. Mm -hmm. So give the black and brown coaches an opportunity the same way you would the white coach. Yeah. Well said. I'm glad Brian Flores me. is still holding on in Miami. Listen, I like Brian Flores. I like him a lot. And I, I guarantee you, for those of you that don't know Brian Flores down in, in Miami, the moment he starts winning – then what will happen is he becomes this brash, outspoken coach because he's so fiery on the sidelines. But mm -hmm. this past year, when he was given a team that was supposed to win maybe one game, he found a way to win four. So that's good coaching, and I like Brian Flores because he didn't give up on his team, even though he knew I was put in a bad situation. This team was trying to tank it away, but I'm still going to try to find a way to win some games. And he played Jay-Z all through that practice after Ken Stills was talking that, that smack about Hove. He all started through. playing Jay-Z all through practice and then right. got rid of him. <laughs> Coach Flores, you're more than welcome on the show anytime you want, brother. Exactly. Anytime you want to come on the show. So I know we're going to wrap up soon, but just some other news in NFL that we can kind of touch upon um, real quick is uh, the Ravens are set to pay all their stadium workers, even if the games are played without fans. So shout out to the Ravens, shout out to Baltimore. You already know how I mm -hmm. feel about them. So I thought that's beautiful because, you know, we, we talked about this last episode were these sports that, uh, these athletes were so eager to come back. And we kept saying, you know, the quarantine's affecting people differently. But to think about those people who have these jobs that, um, you know, we want sports to come back because we need the workers at these stadiums to have an income. So this is amazing. And I know that all these sports teams have the capital to pay these workers. Sports bring in so much money. So I'm really excited to see that. Especially these football teams. These are all billion-dollar organizations. They got it. Right. For the most part, though, I want to say the, the Ravens have, have displayed themselves as a class organization. Yep. Um, you know, little hiccups here and there, but for the most part, they, they've displayed that, that type of integrity. So I'm not too surprised, and I tip my hat to them for that. So you guys know quarantine has people going crazy, but this next story is unreal. Um, NFL uh, players Quentin Dunbar and DeAndre Baker um, have turned themselves in because this last weekend they decided to – um, commit armed robbery. Um, apparently, they were at a get-together, um, not practicing social distancing. 
and an argument had broke out and they apparently pulled out a semi a semi-automatic um, and started to rob the individuals at the party. So this is just insane that this even happened, but what are you doing robbing people? What are you doing taking almost $7,000 worth of chain uh, watches and, and jewelry? It's just insane. Um, and also just to name one more, Ed Oliver is allowed to practice um, in team activities after arrest. So clearly people are losing their mind during quarantine. Yeah, Ed, Ed Oliver, his situation was a little different because he, he was on the sauce, he had a little bit too much and he thought it was okay for him to get behind the wheel. And we know how that situation ends up, you know? So his was a little bit different. Um, that was just, you know, just irresponsible on, on his behalf. Um, I hope he, he, he gets some help because obviously clearly he needs to talk to somebody. Something's going on. You know, I, I never understand these guys that, that go out and get DUIs when you have drivers, you have Uber, you have so many different options on how to get home if you're going to go outside. So at this point, I'm just like, you know, I, I just, I, I can't, I have no sympathy for you at this point. You got to know better. You've seen this over and over again, as far as Ed Oliver goes. But um, with the other two, with, with, with Baker, first of all, as a Giants fan, I'm just disgusted because, you know what I'm saying, that you would even be involved in something like this anyway when you're supposed to be at home. Um, they have, however, um, have several uh, statements from eyewitnesses that were at the event saying that it wasn't those two. Um, we're still early in this whole in this whole case. Um, I'm glad that they, they did turn themselves in, mm -hmm. but I'm sure that within the next couple of days, and by the time we get back um, next week, we'll have a lot more information. Um, and see, I hope it's not the case. I, mm -hmm. I really hope that these guys would not throw away their career for a couple thousand dollars. I'm, I'm hoping that, and I pray that's not the case, but again, we're going to have to wait on that one for a little bit more info to come out. Yeah, um, in regards to Ed Oliver, I like Ed, Ed Oliver. Uh, he was my favorite rookie coming out last year, but that was a, a just a foolish move. You could have paid one of your boys to drive you home. You could have got an Uber, a Lyft. Um, I mean, I don't even know where you were going because the city of Buffalo is under quarantine as well. So <laughs> yeah. I don't even know where you were driving that you were drunk and then decided to get in the car. When You could have drank at home, bro, or you could have just stood wherever you were at. Um, but that was foolishness, and he's got to be better than that. He's, he knows he's got to do better than that. Yeah. Um, again, a first-round pick with high expectations and got a lot of his guaranteed money, so he got to be better. Mm -hmm. uh, Quentin Dunbar, uh, DeAndre Baker, who was another first-round pick, that situation could ruin your career, man. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I hope for their sake, they're both young guys, I hope that it isn't true. I hope that they're able to beat these charges, not just because they're football players, but because we understand that, in the world we live in, young black men with that type of charge, they're done. Yeah. They, they are not getting a second chance mm -hmm. ever. And I hope it's untrue. However, if it is true, I mean, that is one of the dumbest things you could do to be at a party, decide to stick up the party and for, for a couple of dollars when both of y'all making NFL money. Like, you can't tell me it's that bad that yeah. you that you got to rob a party, bro. I think that's the most puzzle, puzzling part of it because it's like you guys are NFL. Like, the headline sounds insane. Like, two NFL players commit armed robbery. Like, what? Not that it's ever justified, but dang, it's not like it's like, you know, single mom with that's poor or, like, this random kid. Like, it's like NFL players. So, yeah, I mean, I, they always say that money doesn't. I mean. First round draft picks, right? Right, first round draft picks. And... and the uh, I believe it was the New York Post who had the story out today, and I laughed when I saw when I read the story, not because it's funny, but because so DeAndre Baker gets held on a twenty thousand dollar bond. He bonds out immediately, um, one because he has the money, but two because last year when he signed his rookie deal with the Giants, he got six million dollars guaranteed. So it's like, what the hell are you doing? If you did this, what yeah. were you thinking? Because if you could bond yourself out with twenty thousand dollars just like that, the moment you went into jail you damn sure didn't need to rob the party. Yeah. yeah. I, part of me, you know, and hopefully this, this will come out later, you know, that it's not fully, this isn't the, fully, the full story, right? I thought when I read it, um, the fact that they were at a house party and, a, and an argument broke out and that they pulled out a gun, I think that, you know, maybe drinking was involved. Somebody got a little arrogant and tried to flex and maybe he pressed somebody. But you got to think about who's around you and who's thinking, oh, they are 
so-and-so with millions of dollars, I'm going to sue, or I'm going to say this. So you, you know, you have to leave that up to for interpretation. Like you never know the situation because I can't fathom them robbing someone with the intention to take their things. If they have yeah. this much money, it's just like, I don't know. It's really, it's a weird situation. Very, very weird story. And like I said, for, for their sakes and their career, I hope it's untrue um, because I would hate for young guys with the potential they have, especially DeAndre Baker, again, a first round pick coming out of Georgia to kind of throw it all away for something as stupid as armed robbery. Like, right. come on, bro. You, you just got $6 million last year from yeah. the Giants. There's no way you hurt. There's no way you're hurting for money that bad right now. No yeah. way. Again, we definitely thank um, everybody, you know, that's on the front lines out there. You guys, um, you know, saw last week that we went out for uh, Todd Gibson to uh, Fort Greene and uh, he brought food to the, to the NYCHA workers. So big shout out to him again and to all of the, the workers that are on the front lines. Um, and uh, finally, damn, it sucks. Cause I, I hate to, I hate to have to, uh, you know, talk about this last uh, story just because, you know, OG uh, King Kurt is a friend of the show, and it, and it, and we literally just donned the the Nets gaming crew as our uh, official Real for Israel talk team, but they actually had a couple of well, they had one suspension, and they had one uh, fine uh, for for players on the um on on the Nets uh, gaming crew team. So uh, Randolph Moreno, he is suspended for the entire 2020 um, NBA 2K League season for mm -hmm. conduct uh, that was detrimental to the team. And uh, they also, they fined uh, Wavy, uh, Isaiah Wavy Hancock, $750. So, uh, you know, shout out to OG King Kurt. We know, we know you're going to get this thing together. And, 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 and I drafted uh, Chop this year who, who came on the show earlier. So, you know what I'm saying? We know you're going you're gonna to get it together, bro. I just, I don't know what the 2K dudes is thinking to even get kicked out the league. All you got to do is play a game, bro. Crazy. Crazy. Yeah. I was thinking the same thing. Like, what? You ain't even got to be in shape. You ain't got to do nothing. <laughs> like, just, just sit down and Mind play the business. Yeah. Play and it's crazy game, because, uh, shout out to CJ. So, the other player that we interviewed at the uh, the 2K league draft, Tom Lee Cook, Actually, he was coming off of getting suspended from the first season of the NBA 2K League, and, and she spoke to him about that, you know what I'm saying? And, and, he, and he spoke about how hard it was coming back. Wow. It was just like, yo, like, it's crazy. Like, come on, man. And This is every kid's dream. You're getting once-in-a-lifetime opportunities that aren't – it's not your everyday job. And even just as you go back and speak about – those men getting arrested and doing just this, this foolishness it's like it makes you realize that money doesn't change you it amplifies who you are and it really comes down to a character thing and what are you guys doing like what are you doing you know yeah. so insane and that's a wrap for today's show thank you guys so much for always tuning in and staying locked with us on this quarantine lockdown we'll be back next week for more sports news um once again i'm your host emma marie and I have Legend in Two Games and Trip Young. We up out of here. Peace. Peace. Live from the camp. Live the camp. Uh huh. This is Hi, real yeah. fans, real talk. talk. Real fans, real talk. We as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk. We the illest of course. Real fans, real talk. We the illest of course. Real fans, real talk. We as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk. Reporting live from the cam. What we got is worth a lot, so put a tie on your plans. On court, talking sports through the eyes of the fans. With Trip Young, Emma Marie, Eric Sanchez. You heard what I said, we elite. Check the latest topics and stay ahead of the beat. Keep us in your topics and uh -huh. we ahead of the Yo. streets. It's Johnny Floss, bringing a different type of blend. Backing up Misfit to make sure y'all tuned in. You gotta watch, this show is one of a kind. Updates on your TV screen from 8 to 9. For the older folks, so even if you younger, no matter what sport, this show, we got it covered. It's filmed live in the middle of BK, so ain't no better sports show to watch on Thursdays. Real, real fans, show. real talk, we as real as you thought. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we the illest of course. Real fans, real talk, we as real as you thought.